Yeah, yeah, there's a point. That's the the thing that the original diagnosis when it's when they tell you it's follicular lymphoma, they tell you that the the best you can hope for is a remission period. Right. Um, but the more you treat it, the faster it comes back. The shorter the remission periods will be, right. and the more aggressive the cancer will be. All right, all right, all right. Carver Soldier coming at you from Austin, Texas. Today we've got a new playlist on my YouTube channel and a new podcast called The Carnivore Way. And we're going to be focusing on carnivore YouTubers. This carnivore YouTuber is from way down under, I believe he's from Brisbane or Brisbane as they call it. And uh, his name is David Charles. He's known as DC Learning to Live. And he's got an incredible story to share with us about fighting cancer through carnivore. So let me bring him in and we'll let him introduce himself. Hey, David, how you doing? Hey, Larry. I'm, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. I really yeah. Now, do you want me to call you David or DC? Uh, David's fine or DC. Okay. okay. Yeah, either one's fine. Cool. Yeah. Well, I gave him a little teaser. Why don't you just introduce yourself first, who you are? Did I say it right? Are you in Brisbane or Brisbane? Yep, that's right. You... Yeah, Brisbane. Brisbane. Okay, yeah. you're in Brisbane. Yeah. 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 Or you, you just call it Brizzy for short. Brizzy. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all about the short. Yeah. Yeah. The quicker, the better. Okay. So my story started back in 2011 when I was living in Japan with my wife in a small town between the city of Sendai and the coast of Miyagi. Miyagi is the prefecture, it's like state in Japan. Mm -hmm. In March 11, we were hit by a nine magnitude earthquake and then the tsunami afterwards. That was pretty brutal. You know, this was an earthquake that lasted six and a half minutes almost. It was six minutes, 15, 16 seconds or so. It's like the longest six minutes of your life. Wait, listen, I got to break in because I've been in a big earthquake, but nothing yeah. that big. I was in the Bay Area during the Loma Prieta earthquake which was 5.6 yeah. and yeah. it lasted for 40 seconds, I think, or 36. And I got to tell you, that was the longest 36 seconds of my life too, because, yeah. and I can't imagine yours is thousands of times more strong than that. Yeah. Um, well, it's, and it was a shallow one as well. So, yeah. Which makes it more violent. Uh, yeah. Like you said, like most earthquakes only last 15 to you know 40 odd seconds. They mm -hmm. don't last that long. And they do a lot of damage, of course, but this one lasted over six minutes, you know, and it, it just kept rolling and rolling. It was crazy. And in the days following it, like even the aftershocks, some of the aftershocks were over eight magnitude. You wow. Know? You know, and you so guys were in shock because I know I was in shock from the earthquake. Yeah. It's like PTSD. Yeah. You go through a shock yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah, it, you do. You certainly do. Especially how long it lasted it just it just kept going you keep mm. expecting it to stop because japan has a lot of earthquakes i was quite used to them they would only last a few seconds though but this one just kept going and going and then every on average for the first couple of weeks after that every five minutes there was another aftershock and some of like i said were over eight magnitude themselves it got to the it got to the point a friend of mine was saying we were talking about it and he said like anything under seven magnitude is not worth getting out of bed for. <laughs> we just got, we started getting used to it. It was crazy. That's incredible. Yeah. And yeah, then we spent the next few months. We, were, we had, we had a little bit of uh, preparation because of previous earthquakes. So we had a little bit of food and water and stuff like that, but then all the food supplies and everything were, were cut off. So we were stuck the next couple of months to riding around on bicycles trying to find food and water and then I was, I was having some health issues getting sick with colds and flus and things like that i had um, a bit of abdominal pain um, but it, it was through those times that it's not like i had a lot of time to go see a doctor and get this checked out and then i started when things started settling down and we did a bit of volunteer work going out cleaning up some of the tsunami areas and helping people in shelters and then tried to rebuild our lives and 
throughout all this, I had family in Australia telling me you have to come back to Australia and, you know, forget about that stuff. And I was adamant I was going to stay in Japan because that's where my whole life was. You know, well, my, well, let me stop you here. What was your life in Japan at that time? You and your wife, what were you doing for a well, living before the yeah. earthquake? Yeah, I was, a, I was a strength and conditioning coach. I also taught English to uh, kids and up, up to university level on as a side job. But I had my own strength and conditioning business as well. My wife is a seamstress. She worked for a, a bridal company. And so she went back to work after about three months. And I was trying to rebuild everything, the, the business and and teaching and things like that. And this, this all went on till December of 2011. And I got pretty much just got sick of my family telling me to come back to Australia. So I came back for a two week vacation over Christmas and I arrived in Australia on the 21st of December. And I, the, the plan was just to stay for two weeks, but I had a flu when I arrived, when I got off the plane. So I decided to get a checkup and they did a blood test. And when the results came back, the, the, the doctor was a little bit puzzled and didn't know what to, what to make of it because I looked very fit and healthy. I was lean. I mean, the day I left Japan, I, I went to the gym and so he felt around my stomach a bit and he said, look, I think you should stay here and get this sorted out. And by this stage, I was feeling a bit puzzled myself. So I, I called my wife and I told her, look, I'm not sure I'll be able to go back to Japan on the scheduled date because I've, uh, I might be a little bit sicker than I thought, but she managed to get three weeks off work and come out and see me to find out what was going on. And the day she arrived, I got a call from hospital in the city. See, my, I was staying out at my parents' place, which was about four hours drive in the countryside from the city. And they asked me to go in to the hospital that night. It, it ended up being the next morning, but we went into the hospital and my head was spinning. Actually, I, I got there and about 10 minutes later, they were rushing me into a, a ward and I was in a bed and I, would, I had a team of doctors and nurses standing around me telling <laughs> me, you know, it could be this, it could be that. We don't know. We've got this large mass inside there. We have to get tests done. It was crazy. There was, it wasn't any. It wasn't any questions asked me what I wanted to do or anything. It was just, okay, we have to do this. It's kind of like buying a used car. They, they want you to sign on the dotted line as soon as yeah. you walk in the door. Yeah. So it ended up being a, about a week's worth of test. And yeah, some of them quite, quite painful actually. But the diagnosis comes back very high stage four blood cancer, follicular lymphoma. You said follicular lymphoma? lymphoma yeah. So that was a bit of a shock. I was, I really didn't feel that bad. I was tired and I was getting abdominal pain, but it was, it wouldn't <clears> last. <throat> but the diagnosis was that it's stage four, a very high stage four follicular lymphoma, which meant that all the lymph nodes in my body were now malignant tumors. So that was reeled right through my body and midway down my aorta, I had a large tumor. It was about the size of a football and because of the size of it, it had crushed all the organs around it, in particular, my, my kidneys, it had killed my left kidney and my right kidney was down to 12%. Wow. Yeah. So if they gave me roughly two to three months to survive without treatment, and it was, that would be on the outside if my kidney survived that long. And being down to 12%, they didn't really think that it would even be that long because it right. would either be my kidneys or the cancer that would kill me. Before I could even have treatment, I had to get operations done on my kidneys, try and put stint, they had put stints in to try and get them flowing. They couldn't save the left one, but the right one came up, came pretty good. Now the kidney's doing pretty well, even on carnival. From there, I had to do, they, they, started me on what was called our chop our chop is a particularly heavy dose chemotherapy and very violent and that was yeah that was really that was probably the most painful one actually except for the transplant later on that was it left your mouth like full of ulcers bad reflux my stomach was full of ulcers the you know from uh, me, 
Was that from uh, excessive vomiting? No, no, that's from the actual chemotherapy. From the therapy itself, okay. But I know vomiting can cause that too, and people do get that from chemo sometimes. Yeah, from the stomach acid, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but no, it's actually from the chemo. And it, all you can taste is chemotherapy. So, basically, mm. the first two weeks of after, you pretty much can't eat anything. It was, it was like pretty much like fasting because you just couldn't yeah. eat anything anyway. You couldn't keep Which is probably down. good. It's probably a good yeah. thing. It's unintentional, yeah. but it's helpful, right? Yeah, it was. It did turn out to be a little bit helpful because I, in the end, like about halfway through, all the medications they gave me to deal with it, including the steroids, I actually started limiting it, cutting it out, and stopping, stop taking the, a lot of the medications because I just couldn't keep them down anyway. Yeah. Um. But this one, like. It, it had a lot of bone pain associated with it too as well. Like it felt like even just lying in bed, it felt like it was the weight of your body was crushing your bones. I couldn't move because it was just really painful. So it was about out of, there was three weeks between treatments and about five days where I actually felt human, human enough that I could eat. And, and when you were going through these treatments and they got more and more painful and you were getting sicker and sicker basically, and did your mind ever go to the point where we questioned, should I keep going or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. The first one wasn't so bad. They, they split it up over two weeks <clears throat> for the treatment. After the first bag went through, actually, my wife, she only had three weeks off work. So she mm -hmm. had to go back to Japan and that was tough. That was the toughest part actually for me because when she went back, she just she decided that she was going to move here to take care of me mm. um of course i did give her options i told her if she wanted to stay there i would understand because there's no point i didn't see the point in her losing everything in her life just to look after me sort of thing i thought that would be selfish yeah uh, but i didn't even have to ask she just told me to stop being stupid and and said you know it was not a problem um <clears throat> But that's awesome. Yeah, she was amazing. But we thought that might be the last time we see each other at the airport, actually, because they didn't think, oh, it's going to survive long enough for her to get back. That's tough. Yeah. Yeah, that was really tough, actually. And then going through the treatment, the, the first one wasn't too bad. The second one, that's when all the pain started. And that's when you start all the violent vomiting. And you're talking about the second round of chemo, the second type yeah. of chemo okay yeah yeah and then by the third one i'm thinking jesus I, I i don't know if this is worth it in between i'm having more operations on my kidneys i had nowhere to live because i was this was all happening in australia we lost everything so i, I lost my home my, my business career everything all i had with me was one backpack full of clothes and i was staying in friends and families spare rooms and <clears throat> lounge chairs to, while I was being treated. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. You start to wonder why, if I should even bother keep fighting this. Especially when they tell you your diagnosis is, I know this cancer, I've seen your other interviews. I know they're saying the best you're going to get is you'll be in remission or not active for a couple yep. of years and it'll come back stronger. And then each time you do yep. another round, you'll have a shorter period between the reactivation of the cancer, right? So yep. it's going to yeah, get worse. Right. And if you had that much trouble going through the first time you had it by the time the second time comes around, wow. Yeah, I can't right. imagine what it was like to make that decision and do it again. Yeah. Yeah. There's a point. That's the, the thing that the original diagnosis, when it's, when they tell you it's follicular lymphoma, they tell you that the, the best you can hope for is a remission period. Right. Um, but the more you treat it, the faster it comes back, the shorter the remission periods will be right. and the more aggressive the cancer will be. And it's, it's already very high stage four. So how can it get more aggressive? But yeah. that, that didn't really bother me the first time because I was thinking that there would be a remission period. Right. You know? You're going to so, beat it. You're going to, and yeah. I'm sure you're in your head. You're thinking I'm going to beat this too. That's what yeah, I would be thinking. That's right. I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I said before, when I said, when I told my wife, that, look, if you want to stay in Japan, that's fine. I'd understand. One of the options I told her is that, look, if you stay there, maybe I can beat this in a year 
or less and mm-hmm. I'll come back to Japan. So I was still thinking that this was just a temporary thing. I know that they told me this was a permanent thing. This is always going to be there, but I was still thinking this is a temporary thing. But the third, by the third treatment came around and I'm thinking this is getting really brutal and I don't know if I can go all the way out to eight, which is what the plan was. Wow. And five days, the, the five days before treatment, I start feeling good and it, you start thinking, well, yeah, I can get through this. I can get through this. And that's what it was like the whole time until the fifth one, I was thinking, I started to get what they call white coat syndrome. And just the thought of going back to the hospital would make me sick Yeah, uh, because I knew what they were going to do to me. So that was pretty tough. Obviously I got through it. I, they did do the eight treatments. And of course we had all these different scans along the way and test and it, all it did was it reduced it from a stage four down to stage two. And, but my blood was clear, which was good. And my tumor had shrunk about 30%. So it was still quite big, but at least it had shrunk. And then I started radiation and we had 18 rounds of radiation just to target the tumor itself and try and shrink it down. And then they put me on a two year course of what they call a um, rituximab sort of treatment, which is another form of chemotherapy, but yeah. every two months. So every two months I'd have a treatment done and that wasn't too bad. It didn't have the pain associated like that. Archop did. I wasn't sick, but at the bite, there was a bit of vomiting, but not too much. So I, after about three or four days, I felt fine. Uh, so that went on for about another year. And then I started going back to the gym. I was thinking, okay, I, I'm on top of this now. I'm starting to feel positive again. Yeah. And I was feeling pretty good. Actually, I didn't, I was feeling better than I had in a, in a while, quite a while. So I, I was being, I was thinking this is good. I'm going to be fine. I can go back to Japan soon. And then January 2014 comes around and two years to the day, they tell me I'm very high stage four again. Wow. Even, even while I'm still going through treatment and this treatment was supposed to give me a, a longer remission period. So yeah, that was almost breaking point for me. I was, I can imagine. Yeah. That was really demoralizing after going through all that and then telling me I'm back to square one. So I, I said to him, look, I don't know if I can do this again. How long would, would you give me, how long do you think I could survive without it? And again, it was down to three or four months. At the time, I really just didn't think of any other options. I didn't think I had any other options. So right. they, they put me through uh, a clinical trial for a, a drug called bendamustine. Uh, it's not actually a new drug, but it was, it just hadn't been used in Australia. So they, they were doing a clinical trial, which gave me a, a few options at the time. I was having a lot of other problems because of side effects from the first lot of chemotherapy. So they, before the clinical trial started, they rushed me through into have a couple of operations to help with those side effects. So that was one good thing. They told me this bendamustine was a lot more mild than the yeah. R-chop. So it wouldn't be as, as much vomiting. It wouldn't be that bone pain and things like that. So I thought, okay, it sounds pretty easy compared to R-chop. It had to be a cakewalk. And it was, for the most part, it was a lot easier. Uh, it wasn't as painful, but from the first treatment, it sent my fevers skyrocketing and they could, they couldn't control them. Hmm. I actually drove home after my, cause I didn't have anyone to drive me. I had to drive home myself after treatment. When I got home, my fever just started skyrocketing. My, my wife told, called an ambulance because I was just going to go to bed and try and sleep it off. But if I'd done that, I wouldn't have made it through the night. Wow. Um, so 
Yeah. <clears throat> so that put me back in the hospital for a few nights. And then next few treatments were exactly the same. They, they ended up put, keeping me in because of my uh, fevers. But treatment two and three, they filled up both my arms with blood clots as well. So, wow. Yeah, it's really scary. long. Yeah, that was it was really scary at the time. Really long, thick blood clots that went right down from my shoulder to my wrist. Hmm. And my arms looked like a 3D roadmap. So then they decided to put a port into my chest. It's like it sits under your skin and they just plug it in and feed it straight into your heart. Which was scary at the time because they just filled up both my arms. So I'm thinking, what's yeah. this going to do to my heart? Yeah. But they had uh, no choice. Course. They couldn't feed you through your arms anymore. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, yeah. there was just no option. Yeah. Uh, and they weren't going to try and they weren't going <laughs> to stop the treatment. Also, we did that. And again, after that, it wasn't so bad. The treatment just continued through that. It was still fairly mild compared to the art shop. It was a lot of a lot of fasting, like forced fasting. For the first week at least I couldn't eat because I couldn't keep anything down. But throughout the, the trial, of course, we were having update scans and tests and everything like this. And it did nothing towards the cancer. Wow. Um so it was ineffective. It was yeah, it was completely ineffective. Other than making you feel terrible and clotting. Yeah, back. yeah. It it did a good job of killing me, but not the cancer. A lot of the treatments, it, it's not just the the <clears throat> chemotherapy. A lot of the medications they put you on afterwards, like going right through all this whole period, this two years, were all steroids as well. Yeah. So they're pretty much driving my blood sugars up throughout this yep. whole time, which is it would be just feeding the cancer. Yeah, um, I was just told, and I didn't know this before, and it, it may be wrong. I was told from someone who's not a doctor, but that pet scans what they actually do is they yeah. feed you a radioactive marker on sugar and they feed it into your system and wherever there's tumors the sugar goes and starts feeding them and that's how they can yeah. see the tumors because the sugar activity so it tells you right there that these tumors thrive on sugar right yeah and i didn't know that yeah, that's, it, i think that's yeah. pretty amazing oh it is you, if you see it at a cellular level you can see it actually absorbing the sugars it mm -hmm. just it eats it up. It just thrives on it. <clears throat> and this was a big problem. Like through that two year period, I was on steroid treatments all the way through. Uh, and I think that's what shortened my remission as well. Oh, you mean in between tw 2012, 2014? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Cause I was still on every, I was still on treatment every two months. And so they right. gave me steroids to help recover. And of course, right through the treatment, the trials, and later on as well. Then we got midway through this treatment, and they found that it wasn't doing anything, but they decided to keep going. And we got that we got to the end. So we went like the most treatments you're allowed to do on these heavy dose treatments is eight. Yeah. Uh, after that, it's it you pretty much just kill the patient. So that that's what they took me out to on both treatments they took me out to eight treatments wow um and it did nothing <clears throat> again in fact it was just the cancer was thriving um, so you're still at stage I, four and you're just weaker now yeah i'm just weaker i just uh, lost composition really i just lost muscle and gained mm -hmm. a lot of fat i was very bloated that photo of yeah. on my page you can see how bloated i was yeah um that was, it wasn't from eating. I hadn't been eating that, that whole year. I hadn't eaten very much. It's just from the steroids. That's inflammation and water retention. And yeah, yep. your whole yep. body's inflamed. Yeah, exactly. So they decided to do a heavy dose stem cell transplant. So this what well, this needed another line into my heart. This was a CV line and it has two rubber tubes plug straight into your heart and it just hangs out of your chest and has two little adapters so that they can run three different chemotherapy treatments through over a 24 mm. hour period, 24 hours at a time for seven days. The first seven days of the uh, transplant, I'm getting chemotherapy just pumped through my, my wow. body. 
So it just, it completely destroys everything. And day three, I had an infection in the CV line. And from there, I just had all sorts of trouble, my heart trouble and breathing, and they couldn't keep me stable. They could I would stop breathing and they had trouble keeping me going for a, a, quite a while throughout the rest of the treatment. And it was pretty much just cooked me from inside and right. it was, it was a really tough time. I really wasn't there a whole lot after that. Um, my wife was, she was coming in every day. I was ended up being in there five weeks and she, my wife came in every single day with something that she, she would cook something in the morning, hoping that I could eat something. Then she'd catch a bus in and sit there all day long and then until night and then go home and go shopping for me to do it all over again for that five yeah. week. It was just amazing. That's it really kept me going because it was, it really, it, when I was awake, when I could see her, seeing her there really lightened my heart. It really made me feel sure uh, a lot better about being there. I'd wake up, I'd have all these breathing machines on me, all these heart rate monitors and all sorts of machines on me, and doctors and nurses and standing around me. Through the infection that I was quarantined, it was really rough. That was just the beginning of it. After the, the treatment finished, because I had been cooked so much inside, I had uh, a lot of ulcers in my stomach. Uh, my brain was cooked, all my right. organs. I was passing and bringing up like thick layers of skin because everything had just been burnt from the inside. And I was, I looked like a red lobster actually for weeks after that. My skin on the outside was red. Yeah, you know, long story short, I got home uh, about five weeks later. So did, you know, did it put you into remission again, though? Were they able to get uh, you back down from stage yeah, four? Yeah, they, it brought me back down to um, stage two again. Okay. And you get back home yeah. five weeks later? Yeah, five weeks later. And it had dried. It had cooked me so much that... All my bones, my muscles and connective tissue were so dry and brittle, I hmm. couldn't move. And I was obviously I had to get home. I, I needed a wheelchair and then I pretty much just swapped their bed for my bed. And that's where I stayed for the next two and a half years. Wow. And it, it took me that long before I could actually walk at a, a semi regular pace that I could so, keep up with my wife. So we're talking 2017 is when you start walking again. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it was, we were just in a tiny little studio that was pretty close to the hospital because I had mm -hmm. to keep going back to the hospital every week. And it was literally like two steps to my bathroom from my bed. And I couldn't even do that without help. And for me, that, that was, I'm, I'm very active. I've always been very active. That was a real struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, <clears throat> I know after being, I was an athlete all my life and then, you know, being athletic at least, and then being a soldier and military and being able to physically perform a lot. Once my body started deteriorating, I couldn't do that. It was a big mental blow for me where I couldn't even run 2017. I injured, I understood I had a, what they call a profile. I couldn't run anymore. And so since 2017, I haven't run more than like a sprint, uh, a short sprint since, uh, 2017, but this month I, my, I've healed up enough for, I've actually ran two miles this week, which is amazing. I love running and it's, I'm, I'm back. I feel like I'm coming back. So I know it's, I know what that mental thing is like nowhere near where you're, where you were at, but once you've been an athlete or you've been able to perform and you can't anymore, it's a big deal. It is. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. The feeling when you come back to the excitement, when you um, get back into it too, it, it, that's such a, a, a great positive jump too. Yeah. The endorphins. Feels, the yeah, high. yeah. It feels amazing. It yeah. does. But through, through all that period, I was, I couldn't move because of the, the, the muscles and everything. I just didn't know how 
my yeah. muscles just didn't know how to contract or relax again. I had trouble breathing. So that eventually I found a deep breathing exercises that it would help me get at least that going. Yeah. You know? um, and that made me feel a lot better to starting to move again, which helped me get on with trying to walk and trying to move again later on. At, at what point in your recovery did you start craving meat? I remember you talking in one of your interviews. I saw that you your body instinctively started craving meat. Yeah, when, when... that was immediate. That was immediate. Okay. After the transplant, when I could start eating again, for the first time in my life, actually, that was I was really craving meat. I didn't understand why at the time. I knew I'm a strength coach, so I knew I needed proteins and yeah. to rebuild and to try and get my muscles moving again. But I really didn't think about it. I really didn't understand why at the time. But I would just, I, like, I, the only meals I, I really wanted, like, my wife would cook me some meat and I'd get hungry again. Even in the middle of the night, I'd get up and I'd cook a, a kilo of steak. <clears throat> And she started calling me the midnight chef because it was the only time <laughs> I'd cook. <laughs> that was quite good. But actually, that funny story, yeah, because I, through the transplant, because a number of times I stopped breathing, the nurses would come in and, and, and wake me up if I was sleeping because they, they, they wanted to check that I was still breathing. Uh -huh. And for about three years after, after that, my wife would do the same thing. If I was sleeping for too long, like a couple of hours sleeping, she'd wake me up just to make sure that I'm still breathing. Funny at the time, but it was also annoying because I was, I was trying to sleep. But anyway, yeah. But, yeah. Now, how long, I want to skip ahead. How long have you been cancer free now? They won't say that I'm cancer free yet. But you're in remission. Because how long have you been in remission? I'm in remission. So I've been in remission now nine years. Wow. So you've yeah. smashed their record books and yeah. blown away anything they said. And now what about that tumor? Yeah, the tumor is gone. Gone. It, it's, it's oh, they didn't surgically gone. remove it? No, they can't. They can't uh, do surgery on this tumor. So they had to shrink it down. But it didn't actually go away until much later after the uh, transplant. About That took a couple of years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, throughout that period, I, I noticed that I did notice that I was craving meat. So what I started doing was eating more and more meat. And I just figured I was going back to a more caveman sort of diet. A primal. Uh, at, yeah, yeah, more primal. I didn't know about the, the carnivore diet or anything like that at the time. But, but I did still, my wife's Japanese, so we did still eat a fair bit of rice, fruit and vegetables. The education is eat your, you got to have your fruit and vegetables. You need fiber, you need this, you need that. Yeah. And all the experts are telling me you need a uh, high fiber and all sorts of stuff as well. Some of the dietary advice you get from the hospital is just um, insane. Yeah. They literally feed you junk food while you're oh, yeah. being treated. You it's know? all thanks to the uh, dietary guidelines set out by the Warren yeah. Commission, I think in America, from Ansel Keys' uh, research, it was all bogus, and his yeah. sixth country study and all that bogus stuff he did. Yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, exactly. And now we're all sick because of it. Mm. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, um, it's, it really is. From there, I just my main meal was always meat, but I still had the side dishes, just the fruit, vegetables, and rice, and that sort of thing. But we never eat out is one key thing as well. We don't eat any processed foods, um, except we did still have snacks, cookies and cakes and things like that. Sure. But even that, most of that, my wife would make. And so at the time, whole foods and uh, low sugar, right? Yeah. yeah. At the time, I, I really didn't care because yeah, you know, the experts keep telling me that the most you, you can get is a, a short remission period and yeah. it's coming back. And I was pretty much just living blood test to blood test. And at first that was weekly, you know? So they, when they, when you get a blood test done, you, you think it's always in the back of your mind. Is it going to be back again? Is it coming yeah. back? So that part is the hardest part to get around. Yeah. And eventually it, it, it 
went from a weekly visit and a weekly test to six months and I'm still at six months now. Yeah. And for a number of years, I was still just living six months at a time and I wouldn't even like the lease on our little apartment. I wouldn't even sign a lease longer than six months. You yeah. Know? Makes um, sense. Yeah. Because it just, yeah, it was just wasn't practical to think long term. So the, the problem, the problem with that though, is that when you're not thinking long term, you've got no goals, you've got no direction right. either, you know, so there's no point planning like a life ahead of a, a blood test. Well, that's, that's it. what it was for us, but I just kept eating more and more meat and feeling more and more and more healthier and better. Yeah. It took me five years though, before I could actually go back to the gym. Um, and I was, I think because I was, my education has always been lean meats. So right. I've always avoided fats. And I think that's what happened. I think that's one of the reasons why I got sick in the first place is because of what they call rabbit starvation. Yep. Not enough fat in the diet, too high protein. That protein breaks um, down to sugars. And it's akin to eating sugar. I know that they taught us about that in the army survival school. So yeah, yeah. rabbit starvation yeah, right. is a real thing. It's protein yeah. poisoning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that, yeah. I've been eating clean for this nine years, but I still had trouble with colds and flus and they would last me months. A cold would last me literally up to three months yeah. and it would always develop into a flu. And sometimes it, it could make me that uh, sick enough to actually put me back in hospital. Wow. Um, yeah. Your immune system was probably wrecked out too from, yeah, I know I yeah. used to, I've had people in my family had gone through chemo and their immune system usually gets wiped out or pretty weakened. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah it's completely wiped out. Um, yeah. one of the, the biggest setbacks actually was when I, when my, after the, about six months after the transplant, my immune system did start recovering, but then they gave me all these update like vaccine uh, injections to supposedly help with my immune system, but that just crashed my immune system again. Wow. That was one of my really big setbacks and it took me about five years to recover from that. Wow. And from there, so I was always trying to find a way to improve my immune system. So I was always adding things to my diet, turmeric and cinnamon and nutmeg and all these other herbs and spices and fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. Because when you go through all this sort of, you, you'd want to try anything that will right. help. But again, I still, I was still avoiding fats. And that was a problem. So I kept it in remission for quite a, a long time, just doing uh, what I was doing, but my numbers were still quite low. My, my blood markers were really low still, even though I was still going back to the gym and yeah. I, I was, I would still get colds and flus. It would put me out of gym again for a few months at a time. But when I found carnival, that's when everything changed. And you know, when was I, that? How did that happen? How did you find carnivore? My wife found it actually. Um, okay. We, we actually, she found it, a young bodybuilder, she said it was, he said that he, he only eats meat. And then I found, and she said, oh, I found all these other people. Yeah. You know, they, they said they only eat meat. And my first <laughs> reaction, honestly, my first reaction was bullshit. Yeah. That's <laughs> okay. crazy. Yeah. yeah. I said, it's, that's bullshit because I mean. <laughs> It's a gimmick because athletes yeah. have been cutting carbs for decades long, trying to get lean. Whenever they have a competition coming up, they'll cut carbs because yeah. to get lean and help and faster. So it was nothing new. And I was thinking yeah, they're ridiculous. But then I found Dr. Baker and I related to him because he's a lifter and yeah, he's a smart guy. So. I started looking at some of the, the research and I was looking at what they were doing with diabetes and things like that. They hadn't actually done anything with cancer, but then I found professor Seafried and, and others as well. And I'm thinking, right. okay, they haven't actually done anything specifically with this, but it's worth a try because I was pretty much stagnating where I was. 
I needed to change something because it just wasn't going anywhere. So I had to change. I had to make a change. So I figured, well, let's give it a try. And when was um, this? How long ago? I'm in now, what, day 165-ish now? Okay. I'm on day like 206 now. So you're 165. Okay. So you're not far behind me. Yeah. <clears throat> With this, I figured, all right, I'm either going to prove this wrong or prove it right. Yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. I didn't so believe it I, either. I was like, it's BS, man. It's a game. It's yeah. a scam. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was trying to find something. What are they trying to sell here? And Because no one was selling anything other than t-shirts. There was no selling yeah. going on, right? Yeah, that's right. And I was, Adam, I'm not buying a damn t-shirt. <laughs> I'm not buying a shirt. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. But then I figured, okay, if I'm going to do this, let's do it 100%. So I stopped taking supplements. I... I figured, okay, I, I cut everything straight down to just meat and eggs and butter. And the hardest part was getting my head around the th eating more fats because I've yeah, been so, so hard. Yeah. yeah. I've been so regimental in eliminating fats, trying to stay a low fat diet my whole life. So that was, that took me some time. And even now I'm still increasing my fat intake, but in the first three months I had I had to see my oncologist again and I had a blood test done and all my blood markers jumped on average across the board between eight and ten points wow you know, that's huge that's for every blood test around the, about a week before my blood test it was always a, a very stressful time for me because it was always will it be back because the first two times i was diagnosed i didn't feel sick yeah so i just don't know when it's going to be back but after that i started getting excited and i'm thinking yeah. okay i can imagine this, yeah this is going well over the years i've been doing research on you know, all different ways to try and improve this working on my lymphatic system and my immune system because yeah lymphoma is it's called lymphoma because it starts in your lymphatic system right so this is what i need to improve and of course your immune system is part of your lymphatic system so then i started getting really excited and for the last four years i haven't had a local gp doctor because basically they're just drug pushers and yeah. uh, here, here they are just ridiculous, <clears throat> yeah, beyond belief. But I found a, recently a guy who's coming out from Japan and is very good actually. So I, I started going and seeing him. And now I'm having blood tests every three months because I, I am so excited to watch these blood markers go up. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I had another blood test done. And three months from the first one on Carnival, and my blood markers have not just jumped, they've actually just crept inside, all of them, right across the board, just inside a normal, healthy range. It first kind of time, points, I, I think Dr. Baker was actually talking about this the other day, or maybe even today, that cancer is a metabolic disease, or some doctors are saying that it, it's caused by metabolic syndrome or metabolic uh, issues. So if you have a metabolic disease, you're feeding cancer. And if you get rid of that, you can starve cancer. And I think that's what's happening, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is definitely a metabolic disease, not a genetic thing, which is what everyone keeps treating you for or telling you it is. When I was first diagnosed, it, it's, I it said this particular cancer is, is very rare in the younger people. I was only 38 when I was diagnosed, or I was actually 37, almost 38. And, you know, they keep telling you how rare it is and you know, because you're so young and all this sort of stuff, because it doesn't feel rare when you feel, when you get diagnosed. Yeah. But yeah, they said it's all, it's just it, that no one knows how, how it happens. It's just genetics. That's the answer you get. I mean, genetics will make you more susceptible or less susceptible of getting it, but it won't give you cancer, right? Cancer is something that happens based on you have proclivity and then you introduce something to it that can cause yeah. that. So you get damaged well, mitochondria. Yeah. 
That's that right. can cause I mean, that can start anyone it. that has damaged mitochondria is going to have something manifest and yeah. your genetics might determine what what it right. manifests how bad like, how fast whatever yeah yeah exactly but that's about it but either way the result it, it's all the like these things are all down the line of where it starts is with your mitochondria it's yeah so that's why it's really important to me to try and repair all that especially after the damage that the chemotherapy has done oh sure it wrecked you yeah it's far worse than the disease itself so I don't have to ask you why you started the carnivore diet because I know you stumbled backwards into it and then it started working. So that's why you did that. But I would like to start focusing on your YouTube channel because we're running low on time. We've got a great story here. You're in full remission right now. Been for what, yeah. nine years? That's great. And yeah. you're 165 days into carnivore feeling better than you probably have. Your workouts are probably amazing. What I want to know now is why did you start a YouTube channel? What prompted okay. that and why? Okay. The reason I started that is because people, I, I think people need to know that there are options for one, not only for treatments of cancer and but other diseases as well, mitochondrial health, but there's just so many people suffering from cancer right now in America, for example, 1700 people a day are dying from cancer, but they will tell you that they are dying from cancer. But the, the thing is most people are dying from the treatments. And they don't separate that number from how many died from the treatments and how many died from the actual disease. Yeah. If this is something I can help prevent, I would, that's what my goal is to help prevent that sort of thing. I also want people to understand that just because you have a tough time, you're having a tough time now. These are tough times are not permanent. I have literally, I've been through multiple large earthquakes tsunami i've lost everything lost my home my career i had to move internationally i mean these are tough times treatments these chemotherapy treatments um, that pretty much destroy your body inside out your organs your brain my brain was mush for years i and still a bit mushy but it's getting better um, yeah it's a, that's another thing too on the carnivore diet you are increasing ketones mm -hmm. and i think that's a lot of the biggest things that carnivores say are beneficial of the carnivore diet is that that brain fog lifts yeah and this is because we are we're getting more ketones to our brain we can think better everything is starting to fall into place because we're getting the proper nutrients um yeah and if i can come back from literally from my deathbed to where I am now, I'm sure that anyone can, no matter how tough you think it's, you think life is right now, if you just hold on, if you keep pushing forward, if you get back up and, you know, and keep walking, you will get there. Yeah. That's what I like. It's resilience, right? And that's, that it's getting knocked down and getting back up. That's resilience exactly. and you can't yeah. read about it. You got to take the reps. Now you got knocked yeah. down really hard. Not everyone gets knocked down that hard. But you're, everyone gets knocked down and you That's just right. learn how to get up. Yeah. You're going to have setbacks. Everyone yeah, does. Everyone. So even when you're on carnivore, you still get them. It's not going to oh, change. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter what uh, diet you are on, you are always right. going to have setbacks. So don't expect like your whole life to be all rainbows and unicorns just because you go carnivore. <laughs> but right. you're going to have setbacks. But the thing is, you just have to take and take the hits and keep going. It, there's, I think it's there's... easier to, it's easier to bounce back up because yeah. you are physically in better shape and mentally in better shape and emotionally in better exactly. shape. So I think once yeah. you've got carnivore established, it is a little easier to be more resilient. Yes. Yeah. I think you, you don't have as much anxiety for a start. You don't have as much self doubt either because you are thinking better. Right. Confidence um, is there. Yeah. Confidence. That's is right. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Before carnival diet, honestly, I don't think I would ever even think about starting a YouTube channel. Me neither. Um, I, I, I never did. I had a YouTube channel because I was a drone pilot and I shared videos on it and shared home movies with my family. So was, my channel has been around for years and years, but I never published anything on it until yeah. August 7th of this year. And that's purely driven by 
me and the confidence I have and wanting to get the message out to other people because I knew in my immediate circle, I had shared it and people started benefiting and I start, and then they started sharing it. And I saw like a ripple effect from people I didn't even know who were actually doing it because I shared it with someone, they shared it with someone else. And I thought, yeah. wow, this is huge. What if I went and shared it on a YouTube channel? That's what I thought. Maybe I could reach a few people and apparently struck a nerve with people because people started joining really rapidly and it's great. I, I love having a community. It's like when I was a platoon leader in the army, I love my platoon. I like these guys. These are my kind of people. And I really like to sh surround myself with people who are like-minded and goal oriented and help people achieve their goals. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've got a great channel too. I love the way it's set up. No, thanks um, man. You know, that's the thing. We all have setbacks. I've had some really major setbacks in early, like, even mm -hmm. after the transplant, different setbacks through different treatments that they've given me to try and improve things that did the opposite. But the thing is, what's done is done. All you can do is, um, okay, this is the new starting point. This is where I have to, this is where I am now. This, I have to get a, a away from here somehow. It doesn't really matter. To me, it was, it didn't matter how or what I did. I just have to get away from this place. So I have to keep moving. I have to, doesn't matter. It didn't matter what direction I went in because it would have right. to be better than where I was. And a lot of people are like that. They don't have a direction. They don't have a goal, but just do anything, do something <clears throat> that will lead. I look at it sometimes it's driving at night when you, your headlights only let you see so far. And then when, when you get to that point, you can see a little bit further. If you don't have an idea in mind, a goal in mind, just do something and it will, you will find a, a direction from the next point. You will find, okay, the next point will be revealed to you. Okay. I can I, do this. So maybe I can try this as well. That's what I love about this way of eating though, for me, and, and you have to have a big why your big why obviously was huge it was your health and yeah. it was to change something to, cause you were stagnant. For me, it was like, I was sliding down towards a painful death, probably you know, a long and protracted sickness of being metabolically obese and sick and all these diseases coming on. And so when I, that was my why was to reverse that. And I, that's when I thought I'd test it to see if it did, but what's great about this diet or this way of eating is you don't have to wait for long. Like you, your first 90 days, you saw results. Me, my first 30 to 60 days, I saw results. I yeah. really started seeing things immediately. And I think if you really sell out and do it, you don't have to guess whether it's working. It just starts yeah, working. I love and that. that's love pretty that. amazing. So it's yeah. the one thing I've ever done that's been like that. I've never done anything like that. That's actually been that much of a return that quickly. I don't think. No, I'm the same. It's a very immediate reaction. It's a very reactive diet. It, your body is so much more sensitive. And I think that's a great thing too about mental health as well, because you are so much more sensitive. You, you pick up more things. You just see things a lot clearer body wise as well. You're so reactive. If you have too much fats, for example, or you have not you'll enough know. sort of thing. Yeah. You'll know yeah. Yeah. the body will tell you immediately like that day not years down the track because I think like on the standard diet, you're just not so sensitive to what your body is telling you. So back to your YouTube channel, what are your goals for YouTube channel? Do you have any, have you set those out yet? Or do you know what, if you're YouTube, what would you consider a successful YouTube channel? What would be a success in this venture for you? The biggest success for me would be to help as many people as I can. Actually, I haven't really set out a, a big plan for that because I, I'm still trying to focus on my book at the moment. Oh yeah. What, um, tell me about your book. Okay. I'm editing it, editing the book. Now I still have to put in more sort of, uh, results from the diet. Um, cause I'm going right. to incorporate the, the kind of take some diet. time, right? Yeah. I have to whittle it down a bit because uh, the last 12 years is hard to fit all that into a book small enough for people to read. <clears throat> Uh, I don't, I don't want to give my thousand pages, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's called at the moment it's called not done yet because okay. I'm not done. And yeah, you know, this is what I want people to see as well is that 
it doesn't matter what the setback is. It doesn't matter how hard it is. You're not done until you say you are. I don't know if you've ever stayed to the end of one of my videos, but at the end, I have drums playing and I have a thing that has a semicolon and it says, your story isn't finished. Yeah. And that's because people think there's a period there at their life right now and yeah. their story is done. But yeah. I can tell you for me, my, I'm starting to plan things. I was not planning things six months ago. Now I'm planning like long-term stuff down the road that yeah. wasn't happening because my yeah, mind and my physical... Yeah. Yeah, like you, you probably don't wait six months to six months or three months or month to month. You can start looking forward like this book. That's a big yep. deal. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It, exactly the same, actually. Yeah, you know, like I've gone from planning like the most at six months at a time <clears throat> to now I'm thinking long term. I'm thinking, okay. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'm thinking of about returning to Japan or moving to a different country. I'd love to try living in America for some time. It would be really great. Yeah, Austin's That's, great. <laughs> yeah, actually, I love Texas. You guys, Texas are great is wonderful. Yeah. yeah, great beef. Texas. Yeah, <laughs> there lots of. I love barbecue. <laughs> oh yeah, the barbecue here is amazing. Yeah, so that's something I want to do. I've actually, I actually now have. This is. A, one thing that's kept me going through this last nine years is that I have things I want to do still. Yes. You know? And the list is only growing now. That's Whereas great. before it was, I was trying to limit it down because I didn't think I'd have the, the time or the chance. So it was like your bucket list before, but now yeah. it's like an adventure list, right? It's not the bucket yeah. list. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's a, a life list. There you go. Yeah. So that's a big change <laughs> for me. And you know, the di the difference in the way I think and feel, even going from where I was before, which would be more of a, a ketogenic sort of diet that helped get me in remission, but to carnivore is a different world. You know? And Dr. Chafee talks about this and the difference between, I've done keto too, and I fell off both times and I had good results, good, not awesome. Good results both times I did it when I was active duty trying to get ready for schools or get ready for military physical tests. And they actually worked. But I think the difference, and, and Dr. Chafee brings this up, so every 1% you deviate from a completely pure carnivore diet, you lose 10% efficiency or effectiveness in the diet. So if you do a 95% carnivore, you're probably losing 50% of its effectiveness. And I agree with that. So when we're doing keto, we're... We're probably only getting five or ten percent of the effectiveness of the diet that's right yeah, yeah in my opinion right. in my experience too yeah definitely like i said even though i was in remission on a, a, a ketogenic sort of style diet i still had immune problem issues and yeah. my blood markers were stagnating they weren't growing yeah you weren't making gains so, you were no, like yeah. yeah it was just pretty much flatlining and it wasn't until I went strict carnival that yeah. all that changed, you know, and I was thinking better over the years. I was thinking better. I was feeling better. I had eliminated almost all of my medications. I'd gone from 40 plus different medications down to one. Wow. On, uh, ketogenic. Yeah. No, and nothing bad with keto. Keto is a good diet. It's healthy. Yeah, that's right. Clean. Yeah. It's like you're almost there. Yeah, but on on carnivore, on my on completely zero medications and zero supplements, yeah. you know, and you're making for, gains like every test. Zero. Yeah, and I'm making gains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's been a complete reversal, really. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it's but just hey, incredible. David, we're running out of time here, so I want okay. you to tell people how they can get in touch with you or okay. where they can follow you. I've got your youtube page up here but this is gonna be a podcast too so you might want to tell them what where to get a hold of you on your social media okay okay so you can get me on twitter instagram and facebook facebook it's all the same name dc learning to live facebook we also have a page for i've just started a page for people who have been affected by cancer and we are looking at treatments uh, and dietary supplementing and uh, using it looking at it as a metabolic disease it's it's linked to my page there you can find it um, is it a, is it a group a facebook group? yes a group okay. a facebook group 
Yeah. And then so on YouTube, you can... you're at DC Learning to Live, correct? That's right. Yeah. And it's just the letters DC with Learning to Live. Great. Yeah. That's you got right. some good videos on there and you can catch him also with some other guys like Intentional Carnivore doing interviews and on some groups with Carnivore Backwoods. I know you're, you're making the rounds. you got a great story. You're going to make difference in people's lives. Like for my channel, I focus on veteran and and first responder mental health because I think yeah. that the standard American diet, the brain fog is causing people to commit suicide more than they yeah. were before this diet that's was introduced true. because I think it's well, just moved the tipping point. So if I could save one person with my channel, that's like my goals. And just like yeah. yours, if you could help people, like one person reverse their cancer, that'd be an yeah. amazing outcome for your channel. Yeah, that would be wonderful. That's the thing too. A lot of the depression involved, especially uh, first responders, and know, is low cholesterol diets. Yes. It's been proven like studies from, I've, I've found recently studies from the 90s, 2013 and 2019, proving low cholesterol diets uh, connected to a high rate of depression to the point of suicide. And that's, that's, what, something we, that's what they feed us in the military. A low fat, yeah. low cholesterol diet yeah, and that's right. high carbohydrate. It's terrible. Yeah. It's crazy. And this is something I saw a lot in Japan too. After my sister, actually, she took her own life when I was young. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. No, oh, that's okay. It's been a long time, but in Japan, after the quake and the tsunami, so many people in the hundreds were taking their lives because of yeah. everything they had lost through that period. And a lot of them were also first responders. They saw a lot of tragic sort of things. And even when we went out to shelters and things like that, see all these people living in these shelters, the damage, it was horrific after the yeah. aftermath. I actually have a photo book called the aftermath of 311. Yeah, I've worked just hurricanes, hurricanes in America where cities yeah. were just destroyed. And we've been yeah. in there and everyone loses everything. Yeah. And the aftermath is total devastation is yeah. total it's just like yeah. you were saying uh, if you haven't experienced it pictures and movies don't do they don't do it justice you have to actually uh, live it and smell it right. and it's pretty it's pretty awesome but hey listen i gotta get going man it's been All great right. having you on david i'm gonna yeah, drop you out stick around for a minute and we'll talk for a minute i'm gonna drop you out and say goodbye on the channel and we'll keep going from here in a few minutes All right, All hold right. on thanks Grant. all right guys that was a great interview. All I got to say is stay strong and overcome. Carnivore Soldier, out.